the Lamb Jewish Library of Australia would like to thank you for attending tonight's author talk with Diane Armstrong in conversation with Francis Prince. My name is Lauren Joffe and I'm the library director. I'm delighted to see so many people here tonight. On behalf of the library chairperson, Dr. Rolene Lamb, and everyone at the library, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all, and in particular to our author, Diane and Francis. Welcome to you both. For those who are not familiar with our library, we are a major Jewish information resource center with titles in English, Hebrew, and Yiddish. We have an extensive ebook and audiobook collection, which is very easy to use. Our Write Your Story program has published over 140 memoirs, and we are probably the largest publisher of Holocaust memoirs in English in the world. We run an interesting program of events, including author talks, lectures, discussions, children's programs, and a book club. Since the lockdown, we've moved our programs online. For information on upcoming events, please check our website, Facebook, or Instagram. We look forward to welcoming you back to the library as soon as we can open again. Diane, it is an honor to have such an acclaimed and much loved author with us this evening. Bookings for tonight's event sold out within two days. And when we increased the capacity, the numbers doubled and then trebled. Thank you so much to you and Francis. Diane is a child Holocaust survivor. She was born in Poland and migrated to Australia with her parents in 1948. An award-winning freelance journalist, she has received the Pluma de Plata from the Government of Mexico, the MBF Award for Medical Journalism, and the George Munster Award for Independent Journalism. Diane has written six best-selling books, which have been published in seven countries. Mosaic, her family memoir, was followed by The Voyage of Their Life, an account of her nightmare voyage to Australia. After that, she started writing historical fiction. Her novels, Winter Journey, Nocturne, Empire Day, and The Collaborator are based on events during the Holocaust. The Collaborator, Diane's latest novel, is set in Australia, Hungary, and Israel, and is based on an astonishing true story. It has just been shortlisted for the Society of Women Writers Fiction Award. I have just finished reading the book and I could not put it down. Our interviewer, Francis Prince, was a Jewish educator at Mount Scopus College for nearly 30 years. She was the 2011 recipient of the National Council Sylvia Gelman Award for Outstanding Woman Educator in the Area of Jewish Studies. She is a vice president of the Australian Jewish Historical Society and is a board member for two multi-faith organizations. Frances holds the multicultural and interfaith portfolio on J JCCB and is a co-founder of March of the Living Australia. After the conversation, Naomi Recipe, one of our librarians, will pass on any questions you may have for Diane. Please add them to the chat box during the conversation. Thank you to board member Ilana Lewin and the library staff, Joey, Hannah, Naomi and Sophie, who have helped with tonight's event. Francis, over to you. Um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Lauren. Um, it really is my pleasure tonight and my honour to talk with Diana, Diane Armstrong, the really multi-award winning journalist and author. Um, as a journalist, Diane has written so many articles on a wide array of topics in an assortment of publications. And I'm talking about a few thousand articles. Um, as Lauren said, she has six acclaimed books under her belt. Um, I actually would like to show that for those that um, haven't read them, there's Mosaic and um, a Chronicle of Five Generations, and that was shortlisted with the Victorian Premier's Literary Award. And um, The Voyage of Their Life, also a nonfiction and memoir. And then it was after those two books that Diane turned her hand to writing historical fiction. 
of which we then have Winter Journey, um, that was published in 2004 and was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Literary Award. By the way, every one of these books bar one was straight off my bookshelf. Um, then we have Nocturne, which won the Women Writers Society Fiction Award. Then we have Empire Day, issued in 2011. And then Diane's latest book, of which we'll talk about in more detail a bit later, was published last year. All of Diane's books have been published internationally and have been endorsed and acclaimed by really very many luminaries. Um, as Lawrence said, Diane is a child Holocaust survivor and came here from Poland in 1948. Diane lives in Sydney with her partner, Bert Townsend. And this is one of the wonderful things we can have in Zoom that we're between Sydney and Melbourne and whoever else has joined us. Also in Sydney, Diane lives with her, or nearby her son, Jonathan, daughter, Justine, and their families. This evening, I would like to begin talking about the craft and skill of writing, and then to move to talking about some of your books, Diane, specifically um, your latest one, The Collaborator. So my opening question to you is, how did you become a writer in the first place? Why and when did you start writing? Thank you very much for your questions. First of all, I'd like to say hi to everyone who's here. It's wonderful that you've all managed to come and I have a special thank you for Melburnians, your first night out of lockdown and you have chosen to come and spend it here with us, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much. Francis and Lauren, thank you for your wonderful introductions. Now, Francis, you asked me how I came to start writing. Well, apparently when I was seven years old, I told my mother that I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. And I didn't waste a lot of time because before I even grew up, at the age of 11, I got my first projection letter. That was after I'd written, handwritten a story which I sent off with great enthusiasm and optimism to the Australian Women's Weekly and waited impatiently for their reply. Well, it came and it came in a big brown envelope and I knew straight away that it wasn't good news and it wasn't. At that stage in my life, I had a very active imagination and my best friend, Mary, Hi, Mary. Mary's here with us this evening. She and I were hungry to find mysteries. We were overfed on a diet of Enid Blyton stories. And one day we discovered in our imaginations that there was a girl in our class who was about to be kidnapped by two other girls in the class. So I wrote a letter to our headmistress to tell her that I felt she ought to know that there was a plot afoot and that this girl was in mortal danger. I told you I had an overactive imagination even at the age of 11. Well, my, the headmistress, to her eternal credit, didn't laugh at me. She looked very seriously at me and she said, well, thank you very much for bringing that to my attention and I will look after it so you do not need to worry about it anymore. And so that's how I started at the age of 11. Okay, that's gorgeous. <laughs> it's really heartwarming. Um, I'd like to, I guess, look at the various transitions in your writing career. Um, you started out as a freelance journalist, um, as I already mentioned, writing about an array of topics. Um, and then you transitioned into writing nonfiction. Um, your first two books, Mosaic and The Voyage of Their Life, obviously fit into that category of nonfiction. And then you transitioned to novels, to fiction, of which to date you have written four. So to my mind, these are three very distinct genres of writing, journalism, nonfiction, and then fiction. Could you please describe to us 
these sort of transitions or stages in your writing career? Um, or indeed, are they three distinct stages or is there overlap? Well, that's a very good question. I'm thinking about that. It's, um, I started off writing articles and the first article I ever wrote was based on an experience I had, which wasn't actually, didn't start off being a very happy experience. I was teaching in a blackboard jungle kind of school in London. And I was a young, inexperienced teacher aged 22. And I was thrust into this class of girls who were not at all interested in anything I had to teach them. And it was quite a frightening and worrying experience. Nevertheless, in time, I won them over. And when I came back to Australia four years later, I still had in mind that I wanted to write. And I thought, I'm going to write about those girls. And that, again, after my first effort sending a story off to the Women's Weekly, I sent this one off to the Women's Weekly as well. But this time they published it. And I guess that sort of taught me something about life. And that's something I firmly believe in. And that is that nothing in life is ever wasted. No experience is ever wasted because somehow or other that very worrying and negative to begin with experience in London with those girls turned out to be my entree into writing. So I started writing articles and I wrote about anything that interested me. Um, if I met someone interesting, I would write about them. Um, after a trip to Poland, I wrote about Lech Wałęsa, whom I interviewed in Poland, in Polish. Um, then on a cruise to the Arctic, I met Joseph Heller, the author of Catch-22. I interviewed him and that was another article. I taught um, creative writing at Long Bay Jail. In fact, friends of mine said they already know a lot about creative writing, that's why they're there. <laughs> but anyway, that led to articles about the criminal justice system. So I was writing very happily, then I turned to travel writing. And that was wonderful because I was able to travel. So all this was very well and good. But at the back of my mind, I always knew that what I wanted to do was write a book. And I knew I had an amazing family. And so I thought my first book, well, I thought it was going to be my only book, became Mosaic. I wrote about my family and about my life and my survival and my, that of my parents in Poland during the Holocaust. So writing a book after writing articles was quite daunting. And I sort of reasoned with myself, okay, you know how to write an article. So I'll think about every chapter as an article. So that somehow decreased the amount of anxiety I had. I didn't have to think about the entire process. I could just write one chapter at a time. And that's, that's how I got through it. My second book, of course, as you mentioned, was The Voyage of Their Life, based on my um, nightmare voyage and that of 540 other uh, refugees from Europe. And after that, I, th I think I thought I was going to keep writing nonfiction. But then I came across a book called Neighbours by a Polish-American historian called Jan Gross. And that blew me away. It was the story of a pogrom in Poland in 1941. And that was absolutely mind-blowing. And I knew I just would have to write something about it. But of course, I knew I wasn't going to write a history. I'm not a historian, much as I love history. So the only thing to do was to write a novel. And that's how, that was my first attempt at writing historical fiction. And that's what I've written ever since. Okay, thank you for that. Um, it's like you're, you've led us into some of your inner journey. Um, and I certainly, for one, really appreciate that. Um, to, I'd like to push a bit further with your writing. Um, what sort of writer are you? in terms of your writing habits, your, the writing process. For example, um, are you very disciplined? Do you have a, a minimum number of hours per day or numbers of words? And I guess as a second part of that, 
does the rest of your life like go on hold like when you're immersed <laughs> in a particular project well um yes to the, the first part of your question the answer is yes i am a disciplined writer but no i don't write a set number of hours or a set number of words a day i don't do that what i do is every day i sit down at my computer and i start to write and i write as long as the ideas are flowing and then there comes a time when it sort of dries up that's how it feels like i know i'm not going to be doing anything productive at that time so then i leave it and i might go off and meet a friend or go for a walk or do some shopping just do something different take my mind off it altogether but then i come back to it again later on and i don't know how many words i write it varies sometimes on a, on a good day i might write 2000 words on a bad day i might only write four or five hundred it just depends but that's not the aim the aim is just to keep doing it i used to teach creative writing as i mentioned not just at the jail but at tafe as well and i always used to say to my pupils you have to have a place where you always write doesn't matter where it is it can be the kitchen table or anywhere you need to have a time when you know you make a, a date with yourself that this is when you're going to sit down and then you just start and if you can't think of anything you just say i don't know what to write the ideas aren't flowing and then eventually they do okay thank you um your first two books mosaic and the voyage of their life i mean they're not merely non-fiction i mean they are memoirs they're intensely personal um you know they're about you and your family so in a sense, your um, raw material, your inspiration is like right in front of your eyes. Um, you know, it's etched in your heart and your soul. But I'd like to ask you about the novels, the nonfiction, your recent four books. Where do you get your ideas and your inspiration for those? Well, a lot of the time they come from the footnotes of history. As I mentioned, the story of the pogrom that I knew nothing about. Um, stories like that that spark an interest in me um nocturne was inspired by a woman that i interviewed and for a woman in perth and she told me this amazing story about what happened to her as a little girl in poland she lived through the um warsaw ghetto and then she joined the polish armed resistance and her story was amazing and I built on that. And of course, I had to use the background of the facts, which we'll talk about later. Um, Empire Day was based on my memories of my arrival in Australia. And I called it Empire Day because the first clear memory that I have of arriving in Australia was, it was Empire Day, which most of you are much too young to know anything about, but it was the day it was, celebrating Queen Victoria's birthday. And it was like, um, crack, it was actually also called crack at night. And I arrived and out in the street, there was this bonfire and there were children and there were adults and the adults were playing and helping the children light the crackers and the fireworks. And I, it was like something quite magical to me. And that was such a strong memory that when I thought about that, that led to all the other stories that I wrote about in Empire Day. So I guess the inspiration comes from things people tell me, things I read, and things that have happened to me. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to specifically turn to your most recent book, um, your sixth book, but fourth novel, The Collaborator. Okay, here. This book was just published last year to great acclaim and um, it's already a bestseller and it has been shortlisted for the Society of Women Writers Fiction Award and I guess we all await to hear the winning entry, the winning book, which will be announced in February next year. Now, in discussing this book, I need to acknowledge the difficulty of discussing a book without wanting to give too much away uh, for those of you that perhaps have not as yet read The Collaborator. 
Now, Diane, as the author, you have the prerogative to say as much or as little about the plot as you wish, that is for you um, to decide. And um, all I've got to say about that is that it's a sweeping saga. It is based on a true story. It takes place in Australia, in Hungary and in Israel, and it spans eras and historical events in each of these countries. What made you choose this particular subject to write about? Right. Well, someone mentioned the story to me. I'd never heard it before. It was a story of a, of a real person called Rezor Kessner, a Hungarian Jew. And when I heard the story, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. If such a thing is possible, then that's what it felt like. And I just knew that I would have to write a book based on this person and what he did. Now, the story is that in April of 1944, when almost all the Jews of Europe had been murdered, only the Jews of Hungary remained. And Adolf Eichmann was sent to Budapest especially with one mission. And his mission was to send the remaining Jews of Europe, that means the ones in Hungary, to Auschwitz to be killed. Now, enter this powerless Hungarian Jew called Kessner, who was a bit of an activist. He used to try and help refugees from Poland and from Slovakia, help to get them forged papers and helped to get them shelter. But basically, I mean, he had no power whatsoever. And just imagine, he goes in and he confronts the dreaded Adolf Eichmann to negotiate with him, to give him a train, to let him save some Jews from Hungary, to send them out of Hungary to other countries, to Switzerland. Now, as soon as I heard this story, I could just see that, see the imaginative part of me. I could just see the terror that he must have felt confronting this terribly frightening man who had a pistol on the desk in front of them, which he knew he wouldn't hesitate to use. Um, and yet he somehow maintained his cool. And against all odds, he succeeded. Kessner got a train. And on that train, he rescued 50, over 1,500 Hungarian Jews out of Hungary and to Switzerland and wherever they went after that. But he saved their lives. Now, that was pretty amazing. Now, Kessner then migrated to Israel after the war. And he got a job in the government as a government spokesman. So you would think, I would have thought, he'd be a hero, right? A man who risked his life. He saved so many lives, over 1,500. But it didn't turn out like that. And not only that he wasn't hailed as a hero, but he was eventually accused of being a collaborator. And that absolutely blew me away, that a man who had done what he had done could then in Israel be accused of being a collaborator. I thought this is something I have to write about. And that's what I did. Um, this book and perhaps your other um, historical fiction ones as well, they're all a deep and rich combination of real people and real events, like the outline you have just given us, a historical facts, the framework. But what you do in historical fiction, you, it's that mix of real people and real events, and you then brought in fictional people and fictional events. But it's even more complex than that because you take the real people and you fictionalise them for us, your reader. You, you impute, if you like, onto them thoughts and emotions. It's like 
for those that haven't read it, it's like um, the reader, we feel privy to their heads and their hearts and so on. Personally, I always think of historical fiction as that um, body of Jewish traditional literature, Midrash. It's like what the rabbinical tradition of writing to fill in the gaps of the text. So it, it, that to me, that's what historical fiction is and what you have done. You have like breathed life and texture into these people. And I guess my question is, what are the challenges in writing a novel based on real people and real events that are well recorded in history? Well, I, I love your intro into this question, Francis, that, that was so beautifully put, filling in the gaps. I love that. Um, well, one of the challenges of writing any historical fiction is the facts have to be accurate. Um, people, of course, know dates and times. You have to be accurate because if something is inaccurate and a reader picks it up and readers are very, very... Um, keen and very quick to pick up anything that doesn't make sense or that they know isn't right. And if that happens, then you lose credibility. And of course, that would be the last thing I would want to do. So I do a lot of research before I even think about anything I'm going to actually write. So that's the factual part. I'm very, I do a lot of, re I read a lot. I talk to a lot of people. I, I research in biographies, autobiographies, memoirs, history books, everything I can find that will give me a picture of the times and what happened in them and what happened to people. As far as the characters are concerned, like if we come back to the Kestner character, now obviously I wasn't writing a history book and I wasn't writing a biography, so I had to fictionalise him. And that, of course, gave me the freedom to invent. I could put thoughts into his mind. I could give him feelings that I have no way of knowing, and neither does anyone else, what he actually thought or felt at any particular time. But this was, as you say so well, filling in the gaps for people. He becomes a real person with the real fears and anxieties and flaws of ordinary people. And... That's the challenge to try and fill in the gaps in a way that the character will become alive, keeping, though, to the essential truth of what happened. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, in a way, you've, you've perhaps partially already answered them. the question. My next question is that the way that you go backwards and forwards in time and space, I mean, we have contemporary Sydney, we've got Budapest during the war, contemporary Budapest, we've got Israel in the 1950s, contemporary Israel. And for each place and time, you compose for us such a vivid description. And um, when I read, I, I, I can hear, I mean, there's sound, there's texture, there's smell. You were able to evoke it so beautifully, that total experience. And I know you've said you've done a lot of research, but can you explain a bit further, how do you actually go about recreating a place in a time? Well, um, I travel to those places. And I guess, you know, when I said before, nothing's ever wasted. Well, my experience as a writer of travel stood me in very good stead when I was writing about other places. I would never write about a place that I hadn't visited. And every place in every book that I've described, I've been there. So that, for instance, when I describe Budapest, I was there. I walked along the embankment where my heroine Annika was walking. I saw that um, very moving um, installation of the bronze shoes, which commemorate all the Jews who were taken to the edge of the Danube and then shot and drowned. I was there. I saw that. Also, while I was in Budapest, I happened to be walking along a street and we passed a whole lot of 
football hooligans, a whole crowd, quite frightening. And I put them in the story so that I'm, I'm drawing on things that I have seen and felt and experienced, but I'm putting them into the mind and experience of my character. Um, but I, so that a lot of what I saw and, and experienced in Budapest went into the collaborator. But unlike Annika, I didn't have a relationship with the tour guide. <laughs> okay. I wasn't going to get that person. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, when the collaborator was first published last year in 2019, and I have to admit this, that I actually hesitated buying it. Um, and as I said earlier, I really, except for one, I have, you know, all your books live very comfortably next to each other on a bookshelf uh, of, you know, of mine in my house. But the reason I hesitated buying it is that I felt that I had, a, I guess, a reasonable familiarity with the facts of the real Hungarian, you know, Jewish community leader, you know, Rudolf Kastner, as you mentioned already. So, you know, I thought, well, you know, what kind of novel add? I mean, and would it... If I was to read it, would I really enjoy it? Because as far as I'm concerned, you know, I thought I knew, you know, more or less historically what happened. So I guess I'd like to ask you, am I the only one that would ever have said that to you, firstly? But I guess more seriously, have you had any feedback or challenge for many people who, you know, know the story already and are very familiar with it? Or, which perhaps is more interesting, is from people who've actually been involved in the real life events. Well, first of all, what really surprised me was that when I used to mention that I'm writing a book based on the story of Rejo Keshner, I have a lot of Hungarian friends. I, I think all... I think two of them had heard of him. The others had never, ever heard of him, didn't know anything about the story. So that, that was very surprising. But actually, it was okay because they could learn about it, him in my book. So that was all right. But that, that was a fact. So that I didn't come across anyone saying, well, I know all about him. So the interesting thing is that people, some of the people who did know something about him, had very, very um, con contrasting and conflicting views of him, which I guess we'll come to a little later in our discussion. But I did come across people who'd been on the train and who knew people who'd been on the train, people whose parents had been on the train, people who knew people who had been on the train. But the most amazing thing of all was that after the collaborator was published, my editor contacted me and she wanted to tell me that she had actually just met someone who themselves had been on that train as a little girl. Now, this was quite astonishing. It was just one of the many coincidences that happened to me with all my books because my editor is Australian. She has no connection with the Jewish or the Hungarian communities. She'd never heard of Kessner before she edited my novel and yet quite by chance she was at some sort of a social gathering and she happened to be speaking to this woman and the woman said um, I was rescued on a train from Hungary to Switzerland so of course my editor pricked up her ears and she put me in touch with this woman and then there was some another coincidence because it turned out that she and I had been at school at the same time We'd been to the same school, but we, of course, one never talked about anything that happened in the past, so we weren't to know. But later I met a woman who said her father was one of Kessner's best friends, and she was quite indignant at some of the stories that were circulating about Kessner, one of which was that he enriched himself by taking money to be on the train. The money, incidentally, was for the ransom that he had to pay the Germans. But um, she said not only that he didn't enrich himself, but when he arrived in Israel, he had no money and he had to ask her father to lend him 
fifty dollars. So she was she had a very personal connection with him. So bit by bit, I met different I had made different connections with people who were connected in some way with that train rescue okay and I guess um, to push that a bit further did anyone ever take issue with you like perhaps those people that had a close connection first or second hand was has there been any sort of negative if you like feedback to your portrayal well, you know, I had forgotten until you just mentioned it just then. The collaborator, when it was launched in Melbourne at the Jewish Museum, after I'd finished speaking, a man stood up and he said, I don't know why you're glorifying this collaborator. And he was quite indignant. So, and then he left. So he... But a week later, I had my Sydney launch. The Melbourne launch was first. I had my Sydney launch and someone got up and said, this man was a hero. Why did you call your book The Collaborator? You're giving people the wrong idea of him. So two completely different perspectives on the same person. Um, I, I guess we're leading to that leads us to my next thought really is when you said, you know, there's different opinions about him um, that people have. Um, in, in the book and in, the, I guess, the real um, story, there's many, many gut-wrenching and perplexing dilemmas. And the issue that looms largest that you've already sort of hinting at is that of moral ambiguity. Can you please talk about that, that moral ambiguity, how... Do you write to balance sort of that, given that he was a very divisive um, person? Well, moral ambiguity is at the heart of the collaborator. You're quite right. I, I think I became intrigued with the story, not only because of what he did, but because of what followed, because of the conflict and the ambiguity of his situation and that fascinated me because I don't see things in black and white I think that a lot of human behavior is sort of resides in that gray area and I saw Kessner sort of halfway between adoration and condemnation and that's where the gray area of moral ambiguity lies um, people often ask me well, what do you really think? And I say, well, it's out, it's there. That's the ambiguity. And that's for everyone to resolve however they can or however it suits them. But that's what I think is at the heart of a lot of fiction because things aren't black and white. Mm. Things are ambiguous. And I think that's the power of fiction that you can present that kind of ambiguity and leave it to people to decide how they interpret it. Okay, thank you. And I think like much in history, people always assume history is in the past. History is ongoing. The, the issue is ongoing. And even, I guess, in Israel today, I mean, I'm sure you know that there's a member of Knesset, Merav Micheli, is Rudolf Kessner's granddaughter. Yes. Um, you know, and she's in the Knesset. And, you know, she's been working for decades to really try and clear and rehabilitate her father's name and reputation. So... It's an ongoing, I guess, discussion point. Um, yes, the ambiguity hasn't gone and the, um, his, the legacy of what he did is still ongoing. It's still very much alive in Israel, certainly. Absolutely. Um, I hope we have time perhaps for one more question, I think, if Lauren will let us, because uh, I know people have got questions. Um, I love how you populate the book with many different characters both your fictionalised account of the real characters and then characters who live in your imagination and then sort of live out their lives on the page. And, for example, you mentioned Annika, um, a main character. She is not affiliated with the Jewish community. She knows little about Judaism. And she becomes, among other things, it seems to me, your vehicle for explaining to your readers about Judaism. Um, you teach your readers about the Holocaust. 
you teach your readers about early Israel. You teach your readers about contemporary Israel. I mean, you have all these characters, and um, from this character, there's a left-wing activist. There's another character is a right-wing activist. All these people, and um, the reader can learn something about each society and history. And for me, I, I wonder, do you see yourself um, as an educator as well as a writer? Well, I'd never thought of it that way before. Look, I'm basically a storyteller. That's really what I am. If in the process of telling the stories, I in, open people's um, minds to something perhaps that they hadn't thought of or explain something that they hadn't understood, then that's wonderful. But that is not my direct aim. My aim really is to tell a story which will in some way illuminate some aspect of what it is to be human, of our human condition. And because so many of my books are, the majority are based on the Holocaust, you know, Ernest Hemingway once said that war brings out the best and the worst in people. And that of course gives me the opportunity to write about all different facets of human character. Okay, thank you. Um, Lauren, have we got time for any more or would you like to turn over to people's questions? Because I think Diane and I can go all night. Um, <laughs> but Lauren, what would you like to do? Could we got room for more or not? A few more minutes. A few okay. more minutes and then we'll go on to questions because I can see there are quite a lot of questions in the yes. chat there. All right, Diane, we go for one more if that's okay with you. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I want to focus a little bit about your insertion of the totally fictitious, as far as I can tell anyway, and family of the three generations of women in Sydney. Annika, who I just mentioned before, we've got her mother. Okay, Eva, we've got her grandmother, Marika. Um, I know that they're your vehicle, right, for telling the larger story. But for me, they really, they coalesce to create a very a powerful standalone saga of their own. Um, to me, they constitute much of the fiction of your sort of non, of your historical fiction. So even though I know these three women never existed, you conjured them up, but their stories contain many universal truths. I'd like you, if you could share with us your intentions or how that comes about. So we've got the total non-fiction part, but these three women, I felt like I knew them and I could empathise and understand their dilemmas as far as their relationships and with each other and others. That's a really interesting question. Um, we, I think we could spend another hour on that one, but I'll try and be brief. Um, I guess I'm just trying to think, yes, they are fictional. They did appear on the page. They did. I consider that writing fiction to some extent is almost magical because one minute I'm staring at a blank screen, the next minute people appear and they're not always controllable. They often do their own thing and I've got to keep up with them. Now, it's, an author said recently that writing fiction is an excavation of our unconscious. And I think that's a brilliant way of describing what happens. Things are in there. We don't know they're in there, but it comes out on the page. And so Marika, the Hungarian grandmother, I didn't have any particular person in mind, but three Hungarian women of that generation have claimed that they are the prototype of Marika, and they're not. I, I wouldn't like to tell them that. But th this is what happens. People identify, and I think that is the biggest compliment. And it's, it's just wonderful. And look, thank you so much for your wonderful questions. My pleasure. It's, um, it's been a delight. I know there's a lot of other people with us, but I feel that you and I were in the lounge room together. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe one day we can meet that way. I hope so. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you. Um, we'll now hand over to Naomi, who will be 
passing on any questions that people have got for Diane. I'm now unmuted. You're unmuted, okay. <laughs> Thanks Diane and Francis for a wonderful conversation. I can see we have a number of questions from people today. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, the quest, first question is from Cynthia. Um, my mother-in-law told my husband that she and her husband were taken to Bergen-Belsen in June 1944. My husband was born in Bergen-Belsen on December the 2nd, 1944. My mother-in-law then said that due to a prisoner exchange on December the 5th, the whole family was put on a train and transported to Switzerland. End of story. She never mentioned Kessner's train. Several years after her death, on a whim, I entered her name into Google and up popped the passenger list of Kessner's train. Obviously, it was something she never wanted to mention. I know there are not many survivors left. She asks whether you interviewed many survivors from the train, and I think you've answered that, that you did interview someone. Um, were some people reluctant to talk about it, and do you think there are others who would not even acknowledge that they were on the train? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, I only met one person who had been on the train and that she'd only been on the train. I mean, you, you remember over 70 years ago. So my chances of actually meeting someone who had been on the train and was old enough to remember were not very great, but it, there was this woman was the only one. She was only four on the train and she told me that her baby sister was born on that train. Wow. Whether people were reluctant to speak about Kessner because of the controversy that surrounded him, that is something I can't answer. I don't know the answer to that. I did speak to people whose relatives had been on the train, their parents or the parents-in-law, but no, other than that woman, no one who had been on the train. Okay. Um, Sonia says that being from Israel, we learned about Kessner at school. My question about the book is regarding Kessner's affair. Was that based on truth? To some extent, to some extent, but I greatly fictionalised it. There was talk that he did have an affair with the wife of one of his colleagues. I think that's quite well documented. I fictionalised it. I fictionalised the woman and what happened to both of them and what happened to her afterwards had absolutely no bearing on what actually did happen. That was fiction. Um, Rachel asks, did you interview Kessner's granddaughter who became a member of the Knesset in Israel? No, I didn't. I missed her. When she came to Australia, I was overseas at the time. But the thing is, I wasn't writing history or biography. And so I didn't really see that it was essential for me to interview her. I felt if I'd been writing a biography or a factu factual article, yes, I would have, I would have interviewed her in Israel. But uh, I mean, if she'd been here and I'd been here, I probably would have taken advantage of it, but our paths did not cross. Um, Mandy asks, are you writing anything now? I am. I'm writing another historical novel. And again, it's based on World War II. Okay. Um, it's it's Ella, set, set in the Channel Islands on Jersey, where I've been a couple of times, met amazing people, heard unbelievable stories. And again, my imagination was, it was aroused and I'm more than halfway through writing it now. Oh, we'll look forward to that. <laughs> um, uh, Ilana asks, have you thought about writing something for young adults along the lines of your book? I have been approached to write something for younger. It, it's a wonderful idea and I would love to do it. But, you know, it, you have to have a passion for the project that you're doing. It's not like um, going to a shop and buying something. It's, it's got to be something that means a great deal that you're passionate about because you've got to stay a long time with those characters and that story. And unless a story really strikes me as being compulsive, I, I wouldn't undertake it. And that's, I guess, why I haven't done it yet. Maybe one day. 
Okay, and we have a question from a different Alana who says, for a girl arriving from Europe, surely Armstrong wasn't the original family name. <laughs> No, you're quite right. My original, well, I had a few original names and those of you who have read Mosaic will know my original family name was Baldinger, but th that was in Poland, but that my father changed that during the Holocaust because it wasn't a good idea in Poland to have a Jewish sounding surname. So we became Bogoslowski and we came to Australia and I was Diane Bogoslawski, which wasn't an easy thing to be in Australia in 1948 because rows of children would turn to stare at me whenever my name was called on the roll. But that was my maiden name. And then I married um, Michael Armstrong, who reckoned that I really only married him because I wanted the surname. And, uh, and then I became Armstrong. Um, you've told us a bit about your writing process, but Helen is asking if you can tell us how long it actually takes you to write a book. Well, it usually takes at least two years, sometimes two and a half. It just depends how much research I have to do because I, I'm one of these, everyone works differently. I find I can't write until I've got it in my head exactly I've got the setting and the time and the place and the events. So I do a lot of research before I start. And depending on how much research I do, that often lengthens the process. So I would say between two and two and a half years. Um, I'm afraid I think that's all we've got time for today. Um, I'll now hand over to Dr. Rolene Lamb to say a few words. Thank you. Hi, am I unmuted now? Can I be heard? Yep. Cool, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Diane and Francis, as chairperson of the LJLA, and on behalf of everyone here in our audience, I'd like to thank you so much for giving your time to be with us tonight and creating such a special, interesting, and insightful evening. Diane, you have provided us with fascinating insights into your life, your thinking, and your writing. And of course, into this wonderful, wonderful book, The Collaborator. This beautiful piece of literature, which I've just finished reading, is absolutely enticing as it paints different decades and cities from Sydney to Budapest, to Tel Aviv, all carefully and vividly crafted while confronting serious intellectual dilemma. We really appreciate you spending this time with us and sharing your expertise and understanding of some very tragic times and perplexing ideas and all, and all presented with humor and fun. A big warm thank you. And a very big warm thank you to Francis. We really appreciate your participation in this event tonight. You have brought fabulous energy and insight and depth of understanding to this discussion. How wonderful that you managed to elicit from Diane an inner journey in addition to the book, the books and book itself. Um, it's been absolutely a, a, a wonderful, wonderful journey together with both of you tonight. So big, big thank you. We really appreciate the time, the effort, and the and the the, ple the pleasant manner that you've both given to this conversation. I'd also like to express my appreciation tonight to Ilana Lewin, Lauren Joffe, Naomi Rasby, and Joey Wilkinson, who have all ensured the success of tonight's event. Now let me quickly flag next week's author talk. Next Wednesday night, Sue Smethurst will be our guest. Sue is an award-winning author and journalist. She has written a number of successful books, including Behind Closed Doors, Spartacus and Me, Blood on the Rosary, and A Diamond in the Dust. Sue is going to discuss her brand new novel, which will be very hot off the press. It's called The Freedom Circus, a really remarkable true story, one 
of, of one family's daring escape from Poland during the Second World War, their death-defying act to escape the Nazis and start a new life in Australia. We look forward to having you, our audience, with us again for another treat next week. Thank you all for joining our LJLA Author Talk this evening. And thank you once again, Diane and Francis. Much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Good night.